anyway, but let me. All right. <laughs> this is the uh, October. This is the. Are we on? This is the October twentieth uh, meeting of the uh, Open Space and Ecology Committee. Sure. Yep. I got a little green light. Are we hot? Hello. Hello. Oh, you're. I think you're. On. Hello. My. A little something. Just low. Is it on? It's not very loud. So that means it's not recording, right? When the microphones are not on. They're all working. All right. Is anyone's working? Hello. Hello. Yes, I don't like it. I don't. I don't hear it back, but that doesn't mean that it's. Not loud. Tell any difference between whether I'm speaking here or speaking here? No. Uh huh. You well, can hear it. It's just really low. Huh? Hey, listen. Uh, yeah, I, think I hear yours. Michael's works. Yeah. Low on yours. All right. Hello. All right. Really low. Gotta speak up. All right. Well, welcome everyone to the October twentieth meeting of the Open Space and Ecology Committee. The meeting is called to order. And uh, thank you all for joining us. Glad we were able to uh, come up with a quorum. And um, let me like, take a look at your agenda. Yeah. We have it. So um, I think, uh, well, well, let's wait till the agenda is up on the screen and we'll uh, adopt the agenda. And there we go. So the first order of business is adoption of the agenda. Is there any uh, changes or a move to adopt? Can I add now? I think you have to agendize in advance. Uh, Michael would like to uh, bring up an agenda item for uh, potentially looking into more garden space for, for the town. Meeting. Yeah, is that something we put out into the future agendas or? That uh, would go under chair and committee member matters, and then you guys would vote on if you want to agendize for next meeting. Perfect. There we go. There. Excellent. Do I have a motion to adopt? A mo move to adopt the agenda. Second. All right. All in favor? Aye. All right. Aye. Uh, so, uh, we have oral communications. I think we have an oral communication. Or, wait, is, or is this committee member? No, yeah, oral communications. oral communications. Yeah. Uh, this is, this is where a public, a pub member of the public would comment on anything that they wanted to comment or something that wasn't on the agenda yeah. currently. I don't, would be like yeah. a, an announcement. I have one. Okay. Can you guys all hear me? I don't think this is really working, Natalie. I don't know what's no. going on. Yes. Okay. Well, the public is invited to come this Saturday night to the Mission Blue Center for a fundraiser for San Bruno Mountain Watch. We're screening the documentary, The Edge of the Wild, about uh, the battle to save the, the rest of the Northeast Ridge and the uh, Endangered Species Act. So it's at 7 o'clock. The suggested donation is $15. And there are, uh, there will be beverages and snacks available and uh, some discussion and social hour. And then the, the film will screen at 8 o'clock. It's about an hour long. And then there will be question and answer period afterwards. So, mm -hmm. yes, the public is invited to attend. But you can't tell because the microphones aren't working right. Oh, darn. <laughs> so, okay, that's my um, oral communications for the night. All right. Do we have any other oral communications from members of the public or the committee? Glenn is right behind me. All right. I do think I have on something. TV. We just can't hear Great. each other in here for some it's reason. A speaker, okay. It's a speaker issue, not a microphone issue. Um, well, barring any additional uh, communi uh, oral communications, uh, do you have chair and commi committee member matters? I yes. Think I have Barbara something. says she wants ah. something to say. Awesome. Uh, one of her things she said when she walked in is that um, Glenn is right behind. Glenn is right behind. Yeah, All so right. Do you think we could give Glenn a chance? We're already live with the okay. public watching. You okay. want to? So the next um, on the agenda was to, the presentation. Uh, I meant to comment on in oral communication. Well, do, are we doing chair and committee members matter? So oral communications no, is the public, okay. and then we have the presentation, and then committee member matters. Yeah. Oh yes. Um. So I think well, what I would like to say, I would like to say under Chair and Committee Member Matters. All righty. Hi, Glenn. Hi, how are you? Good. Any oral communications? 
<laughs> All right, Barb. I'm done communicating. Excellent. Well, you get another chance at Chair and Committee Member Matters. Uh, barring any other oral communications, I'd like to welcome our guests from PG&E who are going to address us on uh, gas line repairs. And uh, apologies if I say your name incorrectly. No. Napalo Gomez Soma. Yes. Good Lord. All right. Yes. Sure, absolutely. That would be great. Well, first and foremost, thanks for the invite. And I won't be speaking. I actually have uh, my colleague Austin Sharp uh, here. He handles customer and community outreach uh, related to all the work we do to keep our gas system safe, reliable. Uh, and he's got a short presentation, and we want to be able to answer any questions you may have. Uh, Karen Kinzer kind of brought this to my attention, I think, about a month or so ago. Okay. A little more than that. Uh, so we'll just hopefully have an open conversation. If we have any follow-up items, you know, we'll, we'll, we might need to take some of those back uh, internally just to make sure that we get you the right information. Uh, and so that's why we're here. So we Excellent. appreciate the invite, and hopefully you find this informative. Excellent. Thank okay. you so much for coming. So Austin Sharp is right behind me. He's going to take the lead. And there's some can, er can everybody hear me? Yeah. Hello. Hi. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, everyone. My name is Austin Sharp, and I work with uh, PG&E's community outreach team. Uh, so what we do is we obviously speak to customers and inform the community about our different gas and safety programs that we have. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit today about our leak optimization program. And just to preface the presentation, uh, what we're going to be speaking about specifically is the distribution system with PG&E. Um, those tend to be the smaller lines, the two, four, six, eight inch lines that are out in the street that run at about 60 pounds of pressure or less. And then they go to the one quarter inch lines that go into your home and run to the services. Um, um, so obviously we have massive amounts of that in our service territory, which stretch, you know, all the way from down south up almost into Oregon. So we have thousands upon thousands of miles of these pipelines that we have to survey, maintain, and make sure that they're running properly every single year. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is, is every gas utility has a program that we go out and monitor, survey, and look at all of the gas lines within our service territory. Under federal guidelines and also state guidelines through the Public Utilities Commission, there are certain areas that we have to monitor at a yearly, which are often high density population areas, areas by hospitals, schools, things like that. So we check those every single year. And then every five years, we have to have a complete survey done of our entire service territory. What that typically looks like is we'll break up our service territory into fifths. Um, each division that we have, and we have 19 of them that kind of split up our service territory so we can make sure that our local folks are dealing with local issues. We'll be split up into fifths, and then during those fifths, we'll do the survey of that entire area over a five-year period. Um, Brisbane was actually not surveyed this year under that five-year survey. We had our normal annual survey. Most of it was done in Colma, uh, Daly City, then going down south all the way down to Atherton and Menlo Park. Typically, what utilities do is we have a guy walk out while they do the survey, the area they're supposed to have, and they have a little handheld device. They walk the line, sweep the survey route, and if they pick up any sort of gas indication uh, leak, um, they have to grade that out and then come back with the crew and look to see if it's something that we have to repair. If it's something below ground, we'll excavate, we'll actually remove that section of pipeline, and we'll put in a new section of pipeline. If it's something on the meter, we'll send a technician out to actually look at that, repair the meter. And that system has worked well, relatively speaking, for the last hundreds or so years as we've done those surveys. But it's something that as we move forward into the future, there's brand new technology and new methods that would allow us to expedite that work, be much more accurate, give us digital copies. And that's the program that I'm talking about today and the technology that we're going to be utilizing. So one of the main tools and what first started us utilizing on this new um, program is Picaro technology. Picaro is a new type of sensor that we've mounted in some of our vehicles, which you can see on the screen here uh, is a picture of one of our SUVs that has uh, some mounted technology inside of it. And what it does is about a thousand times more sensitive than previous leak detection equipment. It's able to sweep a broader area and do it faster than a traditional person walking. So what we'll do is we'll take the car out, we'll have them do two sweeps at night. Um, that's for atmospheric conditions. That's also for you know traffic, usage so we'll get a, a really good reading on if there's a potential leak indication area we'll do a couple of sweeps during the night that information will then be collected that night and sent to our leak survey foot walking team in the morning who will start in the morning actually going out and looking at the areas found by the vehicle and making sure that we've pinpointed every single gas leak in that area mm -hmm. if it requires our immediate uh 
response. We'll send a team out immediately to go out there and do the fix so that the whole area is safe. And usually what happens is most of the time there's absolutely no safety issue and we'll actually schedule that work, have it engineered. People come out, um, a crew will come out and actually do the work in that area. But the main thing for us is that it gives us that nice digital copy. It makes it verifiable, traceable. You know, we have that in our system basically in perpetuity. Mm -hmm. Oh, she left. Can't click to the next slide. Yeah. Luckily, I can talk about it. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, are we going to be doing night sweeps in in Brisbane? Or? We've already completed for this year. Okay. Um, we won't be doing any more night sweeps in Brisbane. So anything that was on the one-year survey, typically the workload is enough that we can send out some of our foot survey teams, but we obviously want to use the car because it's a better way of doing it. Um, all of the five-year surveys, so the much broader residential areas that we have to do to get the large sweep, we did that in Colma, a little bit in Daly City, and then moving on south, we did it through a little bit in San Bruno, um, Atherton, Menlo Park, those spots. And we'll come back, so we'll be back here next year doing the rest of Colma, Daly City, some of Brisbane, and then again, the other segments that we didn't do um, this time around. So it's a, it's a rolling, ongoing thing that we're constantly working with the cities, our customers, to let them know that we're coming out and doing these surveys, and then they're going to see some repair work in their areas. And did, did we find any um, leaks in residential Brisbane? Uh, no, nothing that I saw in residential Brisbane. Uh, we did have some stuff, obviously, in Colma and Daly City. We had about, overall in Peninsula, we had about 100 below ground leaks. So those are leaks that required excavation and actually doing work. Uh, there was a, a several more that were above ground. Those are typically a much, much, much lower grade, very sensitive. It takes the technology to find it. And we just send a technician out just to work with the meter. So like for the 100... Um for the hundred underground ones, how many miles of of, uh, of pipeline would would we check to find? Oh man, uh, I'd I'd have to get back to you on the actual mileage that we Ball, did because it's park figures. Nothing you need to. To the moon and back. So, yeah, it, it would be several hundred miles of pipeline. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Do you fix all the leaks? I mean, one of the reasons we're concerned about this mm -hmm. is because methane is a greenhouse gas, and so yeah. I'm just curious, do you fix every leak or is there, are there some you let go or? So there are different windows of compliance that we would look at for actually doing the repair. Um, obviously the ones that are leaking the most amount of gas, we will fix immediately. And then other ones, we look at engineering more long-term solutions for them. So even if we fix it immediately, we look at, do we have to replace that whole segment of pipe? Um, a lot of stuff that's really minor on the meter sets, we make sure that the situation is safe. Um, and then, you know, we, we may or may not have to do any sort of extensive work on that meter set to actually repair uh, the leak. But yeah, we catalog and look at the entirety of the leaks. It's just based on the amount of time that we have under our, the Utility Commission and federal guidelines to come out and repair. So it sounds like um, what we understood from various things is not 100% of the things get fixed. Some really, really minor stuff uh, is let go, and it sounds like that has a longer period case. of time to get to. Okay. Yeah. So what we do is we is there's a priority system for okay. how we do it. So obviously the more gas that's leaking out of the system, the shorter period of time that we have to go out there and fix it. So yeah, I clearly I understand that, and I think that's good. Triage is important. <laughs> um, but do, so what you're telling me is that those really minor things do at least get gotten to eventually. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it's just a longer period of time because priority wise, because basically we have to assess it: is it mm -hmm. safe? Mm -hmm. Right. Is there an issue with the amount of gas that's coming out that would require us to do extensive work on that system? And so there's a sliding scale for all of that. And the most minor stuff obviously has to get pushed to the back for the workload that we have. Okay. Do you have any kind of estimates on your like total system wide leakage on an annual basis? Um, no, I, I well, I could get that. I could get that and figure out what it is. I don't have it because we tend to look at it on a divisional standpoint okay. um, because typically you know, we do have to average it, obviously, because there's no... Oh, because not everything gets checked every year. Not everything gets checked every year, and not everything's uniform, because one year you'll have a huge residential area, and then the next year you'll have an area that's much more rural with less population density. Right, so right, right. It, 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 we can get kind of an idea and give you kind of a ballpark for that for territory-wide. Um, I just don't have it with me right now. Yeah, no, I'm, I, yeah, I'm curious more just sort of for the annual contribution of greenhouse gases, what, 
mm. you know, a system such as PG&E's would, uh, would yeah. be responsible? You know, um, I could talk to our, I know we have a group that works with our regulatory, um, with the Public Utilities Commission on emissions and things like oh. that. And unfortunately, we weren't able to get somebody to come out because we knew that that was kind of one of the things that you guys would be interested in. Yeah. So I think that would be one of the things that Paulo talked about is taking that back and seeing if we can get some responses and some just some basic information maybe about our gas system and those emissions that are coming out every year. Yeah, I think we could, we could look to do that with our awesome. emissions team. Cool, thanks. Yeah, no problem. Um, um, so is Brisbane a territory or are we lumped in with other people? You're part of what we call the Peninsula Division. Okay. Yeah, so that would be basically everything South San Francisco to the end of Stanford, essentially. Okay, and so you wouldn't have data just for Brisbane? Um, I can get it. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that's not an issue. Uh, you guys weren't on the five-year survey this year. Okay. So I can get you the schedule of when you would potentially be on that five-year survey, and then um, that would probably be the information that you're looking for is the, the, you know, the, the total territory of Brisbane that we're surveying. We'll yeah. And so in the annual survey, does everything get hit in that annual survey or no? You just No, just, just the things that like the hospitals, schools, things like that that we consider you know, highly sensitive, that they're okay. regulatory-wise. So we don't have any hospitals, so maybe just around the schools here? Would that yeah, be a be, hit yeah on the... exactly. Because we have certain things we have to check annually per our federal guidelines, okay. regulatory stuff. So, And those are just schools and hospitals, or are there other There's things? a couple other classifications, and you, typically it's like high-density high population areas, things like that. Uh, we don't have much high-density here in Brisbane, which exactly. is why I'm curious what we do get oh, okay, on the off years. Yeah, okay. That should be a problem. And can, can you tell us when was the last time uh, Brisbane had a thorough survey, residential? Um, I don't have that, no. Be, it would be sometime, obviously, within the last five years, but I wasn't able to get that information before I came here tonight. But I just thought you said we weren't on the five-year survey. This no, we didn't get it this year. Oh, okay. Which means that it's... So it has been sometime in the last five years. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I just... And sometime in the last four years. I, yeah. Okay. Because they didn't do it this year, so... <laughs> okay. We'd be very, uh, very uh, anxious to find out when that was and what, how the status of the leaks and everything like that so that we can uh, add it to our climate action plan and, and how much improvement we're going to have each time that this happens. Yeah, and that's, um, I, I can ask, I can see what kind of information we can get because, again, the issue is, is you know, what, what, what was the profile of what we surveyed during that five-year survey? Right. Because odds are Brisbane was in, surveyed in its entirety because it is a smaller area. So some areas like in San Jose and some areas in San Carlos, some areas in Menlo Park, those type of areas wouldn't necessarily have the entirety of the city surveyed at one time. Right. I would imagine Brisbane would. So I wasn't able to get that information before I came here tonight because it is historical before we began this program. Yeah. So I just have to get that information. For yeah, me. we just have a very aging infrastructure in Brisbane and a lot of the areas and a very diverse uh, as you know, very diverse piping throughout the town. From yeah. New yeah. construction versus construction. Yeah. And, and we have other programs as well that basically assess those things and determine whether or not, you know, the material, the construction method, you know, everything, is it still up to the standard of something that we would want in the ground? And that's how we typically base our um, replacement projects on. Yeah, because we weren't built as a subdivision. We were... Right. Bits at a time. <laughs> you can go ahead and switch to the next slide. So this is a little closer look at the car. Um, the car is set up with a couple of different things. On the top is an anemometer, which measures the wind speed and direction. That helps with the reeds, obviously. Um, GPS antenna, so that'll let us know exactly where we're going and let us map exactly where we're going. In the trunk are the two little items on the right, which is the mobile kit for the Picaro. Uh, there's a couple pumps, filters, the GPS equipment as well, and the analyzer. That actually runs under the bottom of the car. And in the front of the car, there's actually a little air intake that runs along the front bumper on the bottom, so it can pick up any of the gas that's coming through and then it analyzes the rate of gas and then what it'll do is it'll actually give us what's called a leak indication search area so there's a field of view that we have um, it shows up on our map as a bright as a, it was a bright blue it shows us exactly where the car is seeing if there's any gaps in that area that we have to send people back out to survey for and then it'll basically give us a pinpoint of where the gas leak is coming from and that's when we send people to investigate and they're able to uh, grade it out at that point and give us the information on the exact nature of the leak and from that we have a process that we go through to actually get out there and repair it so that would be assuming that all the gas lines that you're looking at are on streets no, actually, it, it's uh, it's roughly about a thousand times more sensitive than what we had before. So from the street, we can pinpoint even sometimes to the house that's the block behind the house that we're actually on. We can pick up, excuse me. We can pick up all that information 
and it'll actually pinpoint where we're getting the strong leak indication from. Oh, would the technology in this car be able to like drive over a landfill and 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 measure the methane on there? Uh, I honestly don't know. I mean, we haven't calibrated for commercial for our stuff. Yes. Yeah, and it's supposed to be able to tell the difference between methane emissions that are coming from a landfill or sewer or other things like that so that we're not getting false positives and identifying things that aren't on our gas system. Um, has, sorry, sorry. Oh, go ahead. And go there, there. Just gonna say, we, we do have a, an old landfill and we would really like to know what's going on in terms of emissions from that thing. Can we borrow your car for a day? <laughs> <laughs> no, unfortunately, we usually don't let it out for other Kidding. uses beyond our utility. Yeah, ones. I have a map from the Picaro website that I downloaded from the Picaro website that shows um, a survey of the landfill, but I, that may not be the same instrumentation they have in these. I don't know. Um, my question is, has the Picaro been through here? Brisbane, no. Okay, so it's too new for that. Yeah, we'll be this, seeing is, it this next is a new time. this is a new program. Yeah, we're just okay. starting to roll it out. We're just starting to get past the pilot phase of it, which has actually been a, incredibly successful because, and I'll talk to it a little bit more a little later. One of the things this allows us to do is normally the work that's spread out over the course of a year based on how much people can walk, how much people can survey at a given time. We can basically knock that out in roughly two weeks, what would usually take a year. So within that two weeks, we'll actually survey all of the area that we need to. We'll catalog all the leaks that we need to. And then that helps us be able to plan out for the rest of the time that we have, getting those permits, being able to make sure we have crew resources, and really speeding up the process so we can get out there and fix those leaks in an expedited fashion. So instead of having the work kind of piecemeal throughout the year, Typically what we do is we'll come in and survey for roughly a week to two weeks in a given area in a, in a division. We'll catalog all of those leaks, come back in roughly 30 days once we have everything kind of mapped out. And then those two weeks, around 30 to 45 days later, we fix all of those leaks that we have within our system there. Yeah. Cool. Go ahead, next slide, please. Thank you. Just a little kind of uh, uh, indication here of what we're looking at, because typically the other... Um, Gas survey devices could only be good for about 100 feet or so. This this goes out to about 600 to 1,000 feet. So again, if we're out on the street, we actually get stuff two, three blocks over in a lot of cases and pinpoint houses behind houses where uh, leak indications may be. Do you ever just take it out for a spin like this? Unfortunately, they won't let me. I've no, asked many times. It, I but... mean, does PG&E <laughs> ever go around and just look at neighborhoods? that might be suspect because of their age or anything like that? Typically what, what we'll have is we'll have issues where um, we've had reports of gas odor in the area and we'll have sent out people and they're not necessarily able to pinpoint it or there may, you know, something like that. Uh, the Napa earthquake, I think is a good example. Oh, yeah. So during the Napa earthquake, there was obviously a lot of concern over how did that affect our gas system? So we actually brought out our entire Procaro fleet, uh, the cars, and had them survey the entirety of Napa and pinpoint any leaks and then look at our transmission system to make sure that it was still, um, its integrity was still intact. So yeah, absolutely. I mean, we call it in for all sorts of things that we, you know, see fit to have a, a leak survey come out and get it done really quickly. I think it's important to add, if you smell gas, yes. you know what the smell of gas is, like rotten egg, right? That you call our 800 number, press one as an emergency, and that way, you know, we can get someone on it. Because a lot of times, yes. And that's, yeah, and that's actually something I'll have a slide right at the very end that talks a little more about some of the gas safety stuff we message to people in general. And that's actually a really good point to bring up because especially in earthquakes are kind of the old conventional knowledge that go out and shut your gas off. That's only if you smell gas because typically if you shut off your gas and people shut off their neighbor's gas, we have to have resources come back to relight everybody and turn everybody back on. And that does take away from people having to go out and actually work with people who are having gas leaks and having gas issues. So stuff like that, that we try to get enough communication and education about. So um, next slide, please. Oh, I'm sorry, keep, keep going through this. And there you go. And so this is kind of what I was alluding to earlier is one of the main benefits is not just identifying where the leaks are, but being able to take out that expanded time frame, doing it over the course of a year. Um, doing it in two weeks gives us the capability to be able to shift all of our resources, have planning, get all the permitting done, get our teams out in the field as quickly as possible so that we can actually mitigate any leaks on our system in a timely fashion as opposed to having a bunch of open leaks during the course of the year. 
this has probably been the most successful part of this program is that having that capability, having those easy, uh, easy to read records, having that stuff digitally, having the leak indication areas, be able to search them out. Then we have those grades. We have all that stuff cataloged right away. We have the crews and the resources put together to bring them out to a different area. So typically in Peninsula, we had our group here, but we brought in several crews from other divisions because we were making a focus on Peninsula and we were able to do the repair work in roughly, what ended up being three and a half, four weeks for Peninsula? About oh, four weeks? Yeah. So typically what would take 12 months took us four weeks. So in essence, the larger leaks get dealt with sooner because yep. they're not waiting a big portion of the year to get discovered they all get discovered at the beginning of the cycle and yes and the biggest ones will get prioritized so that is doing a, 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 that is yes benefiting the overall amount of leakage that's happening yeah absolutely and, and that's the thing is that instead of having it you know there's a leak maybe out there from january to december and you're finding it you know in november, in november yeah that. exactly and repairing it you're getting it done february and then in march it's being completely repaired all right does this picara system also pick up the small leaks Picks up everything. Okay. It's incredible. Yeah, it's yeah, incredibly, it incredibly sensitive. Yeah, so you get into the small leaks faster as well. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's the thing is that there's kind of a cascading down the line of everything. So we get to the immediate response locations and we repair those. 30 to 45 days out, we're taking care of the stuff that typically we have in three or four months to take care of. And then the stuff that we have a year, year and a half that we have to take care of, we're then able to get that done within a couple of months typically. Absolutely. So it's just jumping up the time frame on everything that we have. And then we also have the really good records that show exactly where we had leak issues before. Because the other part of it is that if we find a certain amount of leaks on a piece of main within a couple of blocks, we have a sort of process that we go through to identify, do we need to repair the entirety of this main? So instead of finding something here, finding something there, we now find it all at one time, and then we go through the assessment to say, maybe we actually need to look at this entire system in this area right. and upgrade that entire system. Go ahead, next slide, please. So this is kind of what I was talking about earlier uh, and with Napalo. I mean, one of the main ones is, yeah, like Napalo alluded to, is making sure everybody understands what the smell of gas is, calling 1-800-PG-5000, scheduling someone to come out and look at it. But the main thing that we're looking at right now, because we have a ton of gas leaks that are attributable to easily avoidable dig-ins by our residential customers, Everyone thinks about the commercial customers and what they do when they're excavating and digging and they're hitting into our mains. But a lot of times it's customers who don't understand that even if they're digging within their yard, they need to call 811 and have people come out and mark and locate their services. Trying to get that education out to drop that down because it's such a big number of leaks that we deal with every single year. Is someone, I'm going to plant a tree, dig into the ground. I had no idea that my gas system was there. Um, we've also upgraded across the board for our, uh, just our entire gas system. And we have a new gas control center that we actually are able to monitor our entire transmission system. We also have people that monitor our distribution system. So what we're looking at is having a much more technologically advanced system as a whole, putting in new SCADA units everywhere. So that What's we- that? Uh, it's It's basically an electronic monitoring system. So in some cases where you put it on like transmission or distribution main, it'll actually tell you the flow and it'll tell you if there's an issue that's you know causing loss of flow or things like that. So you can actually get an idea of what the gas usage or if there are any issues on the system electronically as opposed to someone calling in and saying, oh, there's a gas smell. Yeah, I believe it is part of the parcel. Yeah. It, yeah, the, the, yeah. But, yes. So, yeah, so the, so the issue that we, we want to talk, I mean, that we talk about too with that is it's not only being able to locate exactly where it is based on a record, but you can never assume depth. And that's one of the things we like to have people talk with them about is due to just it being the ground over a certain number of years, maybe some work in the area previously, you can't assume there's a certain amount of cover over the I pipeline, okay. which is another portion of it as well. So it's the easiest way to do it is to have someone come out and actually find that guide wire and actually paint it out on the ground so that you're making sure you're able to avoid it. Yeah, also in, in Brisbane, a lot of the houses that have been owned for a really long time. They don't have records of that and it's not included in your your deeds or your property or anything. We don't know where might, the yeah, it might be sewer old, lines are. We don't know where the gas lines are. Yeah, yeah, I mean, especially over the course of if there's been work done, 
yeah. because we will run new services. I mean, there there is stuff oh, yeah. like that that we won't necessarily run it in the same place that we ran it before. Yeah, I mean, it's a, because it has been a hodgepodge build. I mean, we don't even know how many people are on our sewer line. And, and the same thing, I mean, I don't know about the gas. One would hope it was better than the sewers or the water. Should, but it should be. A... It should be, <laughs> but I don't believe it. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's Brisbane. Typically about the max, you only have two people on a given service tee that come off. Yeah. That's about that's about the max that I've I've ever seen. There's a what we call branch services, but they're not they're not used very much anymore. So I, I guess my question is more general on the way that lines are run. If I live on a street, mm -hmm. the the gas pipe is coming up from the street, like the meter mm -hmm. is is kind of on the at the end of the driveway on, mm -hmm. on the house. Do I have to be worried about stuff in my backyard or you know going up to the Hill above always it. good. It's always good. Yeah, I would say no, but the problem is, is you, you don't know, know historically because there are instances, and you may even hit something that's dead, and it's not even something that would cause an issue. However, I can't say what it looks like, what they ran it previously back to your meter, what your old house line looks like. Right. I can't. I can't. Say. So if you call a one one, basically they'll come out and tell you. They'll come out and mark the services that they're able to mark, and that's the thing too is actually doing a USA tag, and it's on the bottom there. You can actually see. They, they ask you to mark out the proposed excavation in white, and then they'll mark electric in red, they'll mark cable communication in orange, irrigation in blue, um, sewer will be green. They'll mark everything out. So every different utility that has something within that space will actually come out and do a mark and locate on that area. Okay. Let me just, it, but it's important to also understand that you know, from the meter like into your house, that's considered the house line. That's, that's the yours. responsibility of the property owner. Right. So Right. Okay. If it's under your home, if it if it's the lines that serve your your appliances. Right. It's on the other side of the gas meter. Yeah. Exactly. So if it's from the gas meter into your home, that's your guys's. Right. Yeah. All right. Um, I have a question. Did yeah. you use this um, Picaro technology to run and look at the pipeline on Bay Shore that you're repairing, uh, no, or that you're no. examining? No. Again, I mean this is this is for just leak survey. The one on Bay Shore, I believe, so it's a it's a transmission line, I believe. Um, you guys should actually speak into the microphone yeah. so that well, the public And I can talk hear. about it too. I mean, the, the what we're doing out there is what we call an external corrosion direct assessment dig. So what they're doing is they're actually digging down. They'll make a visual inspection of the actual pipeline. Um, for the transmission lines, we actually have a different group that goes out there and we do a strict walk on the transmission line. They do a very careful um, survey of it. And we actually have multiple other ways that we actually survey and check that line every single year. Um, because those transmission lines are much larger, typically they're anywhere from 18 to 32 inches, and they'll run at 60 pounds or above, but most of the time they run at two to 400 pounds of pressure. So those are slightly different. And also too, there's just less mileage for those. Um, there's roughly four transmission lines within the peninsula area. Two of them run up the west coast. One of them kind of runs up the eastern side, and then there's a couple that kind of connect in the middle and back feed the entire system. So it's much easier for us to survey those and give them a much you know closer attention to detail as opposed to the distribution system, which will give you uh, a thousand times over more mileage uh, than the transmission system. The, there's a transmission line going over San Bruno Mountain, isn't there? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I believe, is, is that part of 132? Yep, yeah. line 132. So Asked before. Hi, Scott Hart. Hi. Uh, local government relations uh, to the town of Brisbane as well as northern San Mateo County. So, uh, our transmission system has uh, multiple ways in which we inspect it. Um, so, we do some internal inspections, uh, we do um, aerial inspections every twice a month. So, we're actually looking to see if anybody's working close to our lines. Once again, as mentioned, dig ins is the biggest threat to our system. Um, and so we're constantly looking to make sure nobody's working or if they are then we we have what we call a standby We have somebody actually that is there working this to make sure that they're not that they're using proper um, construction techniques in proximity to our um, Facilities, so the line 101 which is uh, what goes up Bayshore um, is uh, it, it um, 
it went through what we call, um, it, it is, is mentioned, external corrosion direct assessment. And so we came and we looked at, um, we took electrical readings to see how the cathodic protection, which is a low electric current that we use to divert corrosion away from our pipes. And so based on some readings we got from that, we want to come back and we want to look and make sure that, you know, we first of all, we do verification digs to make sure that um, our readings were correct. And so we'll, you know, even if there were no indications of, of any problems, we'll do verifications to make sure our instrumentation was correct. And then we'll also investigate anything that looks like maybe it's drawing a little electricity, which says that it might be engaged in a little bit of corrosion. So, so that's what that work is to do. And so it usually is just a remediation. We take the, the, the protective wrapping. It has, uh, you know, kind of a, a tar-like wrapping around it. Um, and then we take that off. We um, it usually it's kind of like a you know sand and polish job on there. Get the little bit of corrosion off, and and, and then seal it back up again and, and put it back um, in, underground where generally it's left alone to live its life. Yeah. Cool. And can you explain the on the? I know that on San Bruno Mountain you did pressure testing on the line. And, but you did not have to dig it up that way, or we did. What, what we did is we did a hydrostatic pressure test in which we um, we sectionalized. So what we did is we, we we broke the line that that goes over San Bruno Mountain into two segments, um, a nor a southern segment and a northern segment. And so we tested the southern segment, um, you know, basically from the top of the mountain to the bottom, um, got it up to pressure, held that pressure. Um, so we, it goes through a series. What we do is we get it up to 70% pressure, then we take it to full pressure. We'll do what we call a spike, which is about 160% of, of, of what we expect it to run at. And we'll hold that for an, uh, an hour. Uh, and in, in industry-wide, any problems that uh, occur as a problem of the hydro test usually occur within the first half hour. So we hold that spike test for an hour, then we bring it down to about 150% pressure, and then we hold that for eight hours to see for any slow leaks. And so then what that allows us to do is to monitor the pressure in the water. And then if it passes the eight hour test, then we, we dry it all up and put it back into service. And so oh, that's what happened with, um, with both the north and the south segment of so, of Sorry, so you're filling it with water. Not, you're not pressurizing it with air. Or nope. you're it, this is water. water. So yeah, so and the thing that's different is where you, it, because what it does is it, water is non-compressible. And so you can you can build up pressure with it, and it also then uh, obviously non-hazardous. And when it when if when it finds uh, a failure, it, you know you can find it pretty easily. Um, and so it it that's uh, it, the you know the method of choice. It's the gold standard for for doing hydrostatic testing. Now we also use nitrogen in some cases, but hydro we usually and in the case of San Bruno Mountain use cool. water. Awesome. And how did it fare? How was the? It passed with flying colors, okay. yep. and so yes, no, yeah, it held pressure on both sides. Um, we were very happy to say that because you know we we do understand the environmental sensitivities of the mountain, so we didn't want to have to go dig up any portion of it. And so other than the big hole at the top, <laughs> it, well, exactly. Which you know we we worked closely and and uh, and worked with Mission Blue, used yep. seed to re to yep. um, reseed the area. Um, I had one more question. Sure. So, um, do you know if the next time Brisbane is going to be surveyed, if it will be surveyed with Picaro? Is that yeah. now everything's happening yes. that way? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, absolutely, the next time we come through. And typically, like I said, it's a mix, but we use the Picaro car kind of in the first sweep of surveys, and then we send our foot people in into the areas that I identify. So, you'll get both technically from now on. Okay. And it'll be part of this expedited program. So once we find all the leak indication areas, once we have our people go through and verify them, we'll be back in about a month, month and a half to fix the vast majority of them. Okay. Um, I had a question for Napalo if... So um, a little over a year ago, I asked you some follow-up questions about the um, survey that was done for the Brisbane School District and the windows and the insulation, yeah, and yeah. you didn't get back to me. Uh, oh, I did actually by email. I have a record of it, but I'll, we can take that offline. Yeah, I'm going to have to look at that because yeah. I asked for some specific information and I do remember you emailing me back, but I don't think I got the specific information I wanted. Okay. I will have I'll to double, check with I'll that again. That. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I'm pretty sure I did. Okay. Um, I'm pretty sure that project's moving forward. 
Yeah, yeah. There, I had some questions about the window stuff that was chosen not to be done, and I wanted some clarification on the parameters that were used. Being, it'd be important to pull in the district on that because they, yeah. they, yeah, because Tony made the some of the decisions on what they were gonna. Uh, approach and not approach. Yeah. Happy to, yeah, happy to. Okay. To do that. Thank you. You and said you'd have. To, I thought you said you'd have to get to the engineers and then. Yeah, I thought, and I, th I'll, I'll take that offline. I'll write myself yep. a note. Uh, yep. But the other thing to also keep in mind is that we'll be sharing this information with the you know city staff when we do have mm -hmm. the schedule of, of rolling through here for Absolutely. with the Picaro. That's just kind of a general best practice for community communications. Uh, yeah. What the city chooses to do with that, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see. But we, we're trying to be as uh, upfront and timely with those communications, uh, case in point with the recent construction work here, you know, to get that, to get that information uh, to the community in a timely manner. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah you know, and, I, I also brought, just real quick, yeah. I want to make sure you guys do um, know the smell of gas so i have these really nice scratches don't the don't scratch them too hard or else you won't get to be able to get i, the I know this and i have extras if you want okay. or loved ones if you okay. wanna... so if you smell scratch that, it? You yeah. Just yeah. one second sorry I'm gonna scratch that's, it that's are you kidding I, I know what is scratch yeah. the front or the back yeah, scratch it, the little helmet the helmet oh actually i may have one more to take to my daughter <laughs> yeah oh yeah, yeah. you have mine right. oh, i'll Get the people yeah. and give it to some kids that they'll like to smoke yeah. it. And I know what it smells like all my life. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and, and the other part to, to what Paul was talking about is obviously we work with the municipalities. We let them know about the survey portion of it because a lot of times we'll obviously we're on your guys' city streets and we will know in your area. But then also, too, there will be uh, permit and non-permit work coming out of that that we want to make sure we're letting everyone know about in the city. So we have a whole system set up to basically share that information. And then with any customer who is having work done on their property, um, where we are excavating, where something would be a pretty big footprint on their property, they do get a communication letter that, it, that lets them know exactly, we found it through this program, and we're going to be doing work on your property. So waiting a long time, sorry. So I was just wondering, are you, is PG&E um, supposed to report methane emissions to the state or to the feds as yeah. part of greenhouse gas reporting and are you doing like sort of before Picaro and after Picaro? That I don't know. That was one of the things that we were looking at potentially getting someone from our emissions teams that works with the Public Utilities Commission. That would be something I can definitely take that back and we can get a response from our emissions team on what exactly we do to work with the Public Utilities Commission or the reporting to the Air Board, you know, things like that. Yeah, also EPA, because I think EPA was writing a new set of regulations on, on methane leaks. Um, yeah. And I'm not sure if PG&E was the sort of facility that's covered or not. I think they're Dude. mostly talking about um, fracking operations mm -hmm. and things like that. But I was just curious if you guys were falling under that. I could definitely find out for you, yeah. Thanks. Do you guys have any other questions? I think that was about all that I had for the program. That, that all sounds fabulous. And that you guys did a really good job on San Bruno Mountain, especially with the re, um, mm -hmm. plant, planting back. I am concerned, obviously, since I've complained so much about the noise for the upcoming Bayshore. work on Bayshore. And I don't know if there's any way you could mitigate that. I really... I really think that the hours that are chosen, I know you worked with the city on that, but I really wish you guys could do it from 4 to midnight instead of, you know, 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. when all good people should try to get some rest for the next day. It really, uh, Brisbane has some very unique sound qualities that really, and the noise really impacts many, many people. Um, and And if you can't change the hours because certain people think that it's more important for traffic than for sanity and sleep. Um, maybe you could like get the loud work done first and then, you know, instead of doing the loudest stuff at two in the morning. I mean, we can always ask, we can always talk to the project team and, and say, Hey, we're, we're having issues with noise or anything we could potentially do to help with that. Um, kind of what we were talking about earlier, you know, before the meeting started is that what they're going to do is they have to actually excavate around the entirety of the pipeline. And so first they'll come in and they'll use heavy equipment to actually take off that top layer. Once they get down to a certain point closer to the pipeline, they're going to have to hand dig everything. So noise will drop automatically just because they'll be hand digging. There will be the small portion where they have to tack um, the, the plates back on for traffic in the morning, but it will 
lessen the amount of noise kind of for a vast majority of the project. Um, we, we can always ask. I mean, we can see what the project team would have to say. We'd have to work with the city as well if we're looking at changing any sort of work hours and things like that, which, I, I mean, we typically have these discussions. I've been involved in multiple projects like this, and I can I can assure you that when we, when we look at this and we talk to everybody about it, one of the understandings is the pros and cons of noise versus traffic versus how long it's going to take us to actually complete the work. And a lot of times what it comes down to is we can work within X period of time, but we're going to be here an additional week. So let it let us have us like kind of a broader time range, and then we can get it done in a shorter period of time. But we, we can always talk to the project team about it and let them know your guys' concerns. Yeah. As well, it may not affect some people. You know, it there was a lot of people who complained. We we don't we don't know until people bring it to us yeah. and then that's something that we take back. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's important to note that the, that segment of work at, right up here at Valley and Bayshore actually progressed in a much faster timeline. So they're done with all the heavy excavation work, all the saw cutting and, and jackhammering. That's all done. So they're currently in the assessment phase and you know, they've graded the, the steel plates over there so you don't see like a, you know, a, a rise in the road. The next phase is just the restoration. So that's done. That's done. The next phase is actually just south, is, is south past San Bruno Avenue and, and Bayshore. So the likelihood of that traveling up and over, uh, I think is what we've communicated out to people. Uh, I think it's highly unlikely. It's going to most likely impact the folks on the. On so the people on Tulare are going to get it. <laughs> <laughs> get it all the time anyway. Yeah, yeah they do. You know, we're trying to be as mindful and as quick as I possible. Know. Right? Yeah. It's, you know, it's kind of tough with any public works project that has to go underground. We're really happy to have gas and that we don't have to bring coal <laughs> for our... Yeah. Coal. Yeah, that's true. So it's true. We are, we are very appreciative of, of the, the entire effort. Thank yeah. you. And, and we're not... Thanks, guys, for the opportunity to speak yeah. to all yeah. of you. And I know we have Thank a couple you. of things that we'll look to get back to you about yeah, our definitely. emissions and, and some of our methane stuff. So. Awesome. Let us know when you want to bring the car through just for a little uh, show and tell and drive around. Yeah. Well, I can tell you that we have done that multiple times with multiple cities. So the next time we're going to come through Brisbane, it's absolutely something that we can set up for you guys. Come check out. Yeah, yeah. Well, bring it cool. to the next community festival. Okay. Yeah. 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 No, we can tee that up and do that for you guys. Awesome. Thank Great. you, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Buy a break? No, Motrin. I'm having a migraine. Okay. Oh, dear. Would dimming the lights help no. you? No. Okay. Fine. Helps me. Drugs help. I don't get them very much, but. I don't either. I just say no to drugs. <laughs> um, well, that was really informative and really, uh, really good. I'm glad that, that was, uh, the, those guys came in here. Any, uh, any other thoughts, or shall we move on to chair and committee member matters? All right, so I think we have several members of the uh, committee that have matters that they'd like to bring up. Mm -hmm. so, shall we start with Mike? Absolutely. Um, I just, someone I think Michelle mentioned um, maybe two months ago when we were trying to figure out our schedule of the body of work that we want to get done. And one of the things she mentioned was uh, possibly talking to the city about having more uh, community garden space. And so I would like to see about having that put on an agenda, seeing if we can get something going there. And um, something I would like to see about getting done if I can help in some way, shape, or form. Sure. I mean, we should probably look at our whole work plan, um, but I definitely feel right there with you, Michael, that people waiting three plus years for a plot is a little silly. And, and it's, it is an ecological issue, and if we can move it forward, that'd be great. Maybe they can put a big garden in the Bayside area project. You mean the park side? Park side yeah, side. Whatever, it's, whatever, <laughs> whatever they're calling it. Well, you know, this is, this is getting a bit of feel, but I was thinking if park side goes forward, there will be a development agreement. They will, the city will want them to do things. And one of the things that the city could require them to do as part of the DA is provide a community garden space. 
Where is the question? Yeah, I That's guess that's true. the question. That is true. I mean, I know there are other places that have been considered within Brisbane, but I don't have that list. I talked to Park and Rec about it, and nobody ever got back to me. As a citizen, I went and uh -huh. talked to them at one point. So without just, getting into it too much, do we yeah. want to potentially put this on the let's, agenda for next meeting? Yeah, let's, yeah. let's agendize yeah. it, and then um, it would be great to maybe if we could... I don't know if staff uh, is able to do that prior to us talking about it, but maybe uh, prepare like a, a, a map of like city owned properties that could potentially be used. Yeah. You know, like I don't know what, what areas or lots of the city are city owned, but potentially, you know, maybe we could, we could see what some of the options are. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe right. you could talk to Park and Rec and City Council and see if they have, because somebody's got to know where the previous candidate sites well, were. I, I think we should have it as an agenda item before yeah. we start Perfect. work on it. Okay. That's great. But do you need a motion for that? Or do we just do it? Does everyone agree to potentially put it on the next agenda? Yes. yes. I think we should do more than potentially put it on the next agenda. I think right. we should right. definitely put it on the next yeah. agenda. I mean, yeah, I, I guess we all agree we need it, meaning we need a community garden. So shouldn't we, for the next meeting, prepare for some discussion, like to Barbara's point, get a list of potential lots or something else? Because I think we all agree that we would like to see an expanded community garden. So the question is, how do we go about it, right? Yeah. Wait, yeah. Uh, that's the part. What, what do we ask Natalie to actually bring us to start a, a, the conversation off? So for the next meeting, um, which we were going to discuss in staff updates, there were, uh, we're going to have the OSEC liaisons here. And I think the main topic was going to be the climate action plan. Um, and so I don't, I'm not exactly sure if we'll have room to discuss this in November, but possibly in December. Can I make a suggestion that we put it as on the November agenda to give you give you direction of what we would like to have for our discussion in December so that we can go ahead and agendize it for December as a discussion but have it on the November agenda so that we can make the request of the information that we would like to have to have a reasonable discussion in December. Is that possible? Yeah. Okay. I think we'll probably discuss it as maybe a work plan item. Okay. Sure. And I will not be here for the November meeting. Did you see that it was moved to the 10th? It doesn't matter. I'm okay. going to be offshore. Okay. <coughs> Okay. So one thing that I wanted to bring up is, because I know it seems like in every meeting we have a speaker presentation, which could take about an hour, and after that we go into other agenda items. And I believe in like July and August, when we were working on the climate action plan, that was something that needed to take a lot of our time. And I think because at the beginning of the meeting we had presentations which were not necessarily related to the climate action plan, it felt like we didn't have enough time to discuss the main, uh, so to say, topic of the meeting, which was really the climate action plan. So do we feel that for going forward, when we have some major discussion items that the committee needs to handle, that we could, if the presentation is not urgent, it's not something related to the main thing that we need to discuss, that we simply don't do a, a presentation by whoever the invited speaker is and really just focus as a first agenda item on the main thing that we need to work on. Because sometimes it seems, seems to me like major project like the climate action plan was always pushed to the last half an hour between 8.30 and 9. And then by that time, everyone is tired. There is no enough time. Uh, while we spent hour or more than that at the beginning of the meeting on a presentation which wasn't urgent or could have been done later. Mm -hmm. Just a suggestion and observation on the how the agenda has been going on in the last few months and do we feel like we could, we don't need to have a presentation and speakers every time if we have something major that we need to discuss as a committee. Just a thought. I, I think that's a great suggestion because um, I share 
I share that opinion that, you know, a lot of times when we have the speakers, we want them to go at the beginning of the meeting because we, right. we want to be polite to them and then... And Not then, make them wait. Right, but then it, it means that the important business has to wait and then we're all tired and looking at the clock. And That's right. I, I think it's a great idea. I, mm -hmm. I, I support your, your sentiment. It may not always be possible, but yeah, yeah, I support that too. Yeah. I mean, sometimes you know, like when we have like PG and E come, that was important, and when Recology came, that was because we were doing the whatever with the uh, not Recology, ooh, the other big people. Uh, I, I don't think there's anybody yeah. that comes here that talks to us that's not important. Yeah, I, yeah. honestly. Yeah, so. I mean, I think the only concern I have is sometimes we schedule our speakers two and three months in advance, and then something creeps up, and you want to be respectful of those people's times and be like, oh, sorry, I got to cancel something. Oh, oh some, got to cancel again. Something came up. So, you know, just the logistics of it are stink sometimes. Yeah. So as, as long as we keep other people's but time good, good. in mind, yeah. I, I don't see any problem with it philosophically. Thanks to Natalie for doing such a good job coordinating our, our roster of speakers. So are we ready? Do any more? I, I believe. Oh, yep. I got some. I believe Barbara has a. So, um, God, what was that? Okay. So um, the oyster flower, we've talked about that, the new big purple thing that's like it's coming into town and it's been spreading. And um, Karen Cunningham and I have been noticing this new butterfly. Uh, it's a fritillary. That it's, it's orange. It's like Cheeto orange with just a few black spots. And, and none of us have seen it before. Sorry, go ahead, Glenn. It's called a gulf fritillary. And yeah. it's, uh, I've actually seen them now for about three years. OK. Uh, this area used to be the northern end of their range. OK. And it, but there are lots of them this year. And yeah. so maybe that's because it's getting warmer. Yeah, so my point was, is and, and now we have barn owls. This used not used to be barn owl range, but we have barn owls here now in town. Um, what I was wondering is if staff or anybody on this committee knew if there's any kind of reporting clearinghouse for saying, hey, this species is new to my area. Hmm. I have heard of something like that. Um, because I think as climate change goes forward, this will, this sort species. of migration yeah. and transposition of species is going to be important to understand. Yeah, I, I've been, there's, so I've, I've read about some efforts that they're doing now with um, moving vulnerable populations to potential new um, zones where it's projected to be where previously they weren't found but in the in the future the climate would be appropriate for their species and so they're sort of proactively transplanting threatened populations um and it's let's see there was the fish and wildlife fish and wildlife service uh and it was in montana and um and so i think at the national level there's definitely work being done on uh, tracking these, and I think that another place that you might want to ask is, is, is California's Fish and Game Service. Um, I was probably looking at it, and there's probably a lot of academic work on, on the subject as well. Mm -hmm. uh, now, in terms of clearing houses where people can submit sightings and observations, that part I haven't heard about, but, but I think that's a great um, idea. Just two things on that. Um, there is a uh, bee counting project, which is, I'm, I'm trying to remember if it's the Xerxes Society or something else, but they're, they're keeping track of bee populations and asking people to, um, well, they're trying to teach people to identify different bee species so they can track those. The, the butterfly is actually apparently um, semi-native to this area. Okay. But in the spring, there's also something called the BioBlitz, and I believe it's run by the Academy of Sciences. It's a citizen science project, and it lasts for, I think, two or three days. And it's supposed to count as many species as possible. And so if you track that year by year, you would see, you know, the, the change. 
-hmm. in which species were observed. So you might you might be interested in that. And also Audubon does tracking like that. Yeah, I know for, they for do birds. birds. But I was just thinking we have that, what's that uh, go report or whatever for city issues? You just, you know, send a blip from your phone. I, I was hoping <laughs> that our environmental stewardship was far enough along that we have something like that to say we have new species in the area. But uh, doesn't sound like it. California Native Plant Society yeah. mm -hmm. does indeed keep track of uh, plants. That's both invasive and natives mm -hmm. that you see, uh, you know, so... They do, they do track down on their website. Mm -hmm. But that's just plants, right? Yes. Maybe at some point we could sort of compile a list of those things and put them on the Brisbane website for observers of wildlife and maybe for school kids and stuff like that. Um, just kind of, you know, do a roundup mm -hmm. list and ask people to participate in citizen science because they really are depending on citizen science a yeah, lot because no all the a, budgets have been cut. Yeah. A bureau yeah. could ever manage this. Yeah. You know, I, I, it just occurred to me that maybe you could have an app on your smartphone that would allow you, when you see a, a species, you could click, you know, and it would report the species. And if you saw something that you didn't recognize, you could submit a picture yeah. and, and then they would, like, geotag it based on the location of where the picture was and, and identify it and and then over time you could build up a database in the same way that like Google Maps or, or Waze keeps a database of driving patterns and whatever yeah. um, but maybe you can enable you know smart smartphone technology to empower these sort of uh, citizen science. There may already be one. Cool. That's yeah, what that's I was going to There is an app for that. Yeah. That's right. If not, maybe there's somebody out there uh, watching from cable TV Google. land who might want to <laughs> yeah. do it in their spare time. Yeah. yeah that's Google. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I did have another question. I was hoping to follow up on the permeable pavement and lot paving. So there was supposed to be an overall talk in the uh, city council meeting about Brisbane Acres, and mm -hmm. that was going to be looped into that. And I th believe that topic or that meeting was changed, and so that hasn't been picked up again. So okay. it'll be it'll be discussed in a future city council meeting. So we're rolling three things into there because there's the um, closing the loophole with the far in the Brisbane Acres. We also did that thing about, Glenn and I wrote that thing about paving over lots in the main part of town, and there was also some work done on permeable pavement. Are you telling me that all three of those things are gonna be rolled into a city council So discussion? we discussed this, I believe, in last meeting as well, that city council has received copies of the letters and has okay. not responded, and okay. so staff was going to follow up on that, but they did receive letter the letter. Okay, and did staff follow up on that from last meeting? I have not. Okay. Aaron might have. Okay. I'm just, I'm, I'm anxious to, because it seems like there's sometimes a problem with loose ends getting away from us. I'm just trying to follow up on these things and make sure that they're somehow moving forward. Sure. Okay. So I, I'd like to report to the committee that there's um, the, the, the mighty Google has reported uh, multiple different places where you can get mobile apps to identify and report <laughs> species. So yeah. anybody that was uh, planning on retiring on that idea, you might want to look for another idea. Cool. But it looks like you're going to have no problem finding something to <laughs> satisfy your reporting needs. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. <laughs> Um, all right, I think that's it for my other matters. Excellent. Anybody else have any matters that they'd like to share with the committee? I just want to mention that I'll have to leave at 8 o'clock today. So. All right. That's a great reason to try to get to the end of the agenda <laughs> by 8. All right, excellent. So with that said, let's uh, discuss the uh, approach to implementing the Climate Action Plan. Take it away, climate actioners. Did you want to skip the climate-friendly purchasing guide? Oh, no, it's my poor eyesight, which is causing me to, uh, not, to, to have agenda malfunctions. Uh, so the climate, yes, let's review the climate-friendly purchasing guide and review uh, with cost considerations. 
So it seems like most of the items in that guide, I looked at it, they're cheaper, except for maybe one. They're cheaper when they're environmentally friendly, so yeah. I think we should just move to them to start yeah. using. I mean, I noticed that as well, and I, I guess my question for staff would be, what what force of um, policy does this hold? Is it uh, is it a is it a purchasing preference? Like, gee, if you're thinking about it and you are so disposed, or is it sort of a, a city policy that says you will order uh, this? I, I, it wasn't quite clear to me, sort of whether this was a prefer, you know, just a, a nice to have or a you must do kind of thing. So at this time, it's a guide. Uh -huh. that has been uh, looped and it's in the appendices of the climate action plan and as a part of our climate action plan we would like to implement a um, climate friendly purchasing guide to help you know lower our greenhouse gas emissions and our waste um, so I just I didn't do a full analysis of cost differences um, so I was hoping that I would start it and then people that had time um, possibly this weekend or any before the meeting could add more numbers so I don't know if anyone was able to get to that so um, the thing I just handed out is a uh, school and office supply list I did in 2010 that I've been trying to push on the city for about five years now. <laughs> um, and it doesn't cover a lot of the major items that the city is looking at because it's more targeted towards home office, school supply, you know, more piddly stuff. Um, but at least some of the information is there for people to start looking at. Oh, that's great. Yeah. It is good. Yeah, I, uh, to your point, Natalie, I didn't have an opportunity to add to the list. I did, I did review it, and I noticed that there was, like uh, Camellia said, a lot of the stuff did look actually to be cheaper for the good ones. Um, so, yeah, I didn't actually uh, add to the list. But um, Yeah, unfortunately, I was out of town this weekend, so I saw this. So should we agree then that the, the items that are on the list, the city can move to using environmentally friendly one because they're less expensive? And then we can expand on this list or yeah. we're taking a different approach? Yeah. I think that's, that's what our hope was, is that um, the committee would help expand on this list and, um, you know, kind of help push us to implement <coughs> the plan is the guide. How does purchasing go? Is this like intended to be purchasing for the city or for consumers or for general? The city. For the city. For the city. Mm -hmm. And how does purchasing happen? Is there a sort of one uh, requisitioning person or a person that does all the POs or can anybody, you know, with a with purchasing privileges, go out and buy stuff and have it being reimbursed? Or do you guys have um, preferred suppliers that you work with, or are people free to order from anyone anywhere? There are um, preferred suppliers for most of what we purchase, and each department has their person that orders supplies. So I think probably a good approach to take would be to look at the preferred suppliers and find, uh, is that, and forgive me if that's what you did. That is, oh, yeah, is to, to take, take a look at the preferred suppliers and identify the preferred product yeah. in each category and say, okay, well, if you're ordering from, uh, if you're ordering from from uh, y you know officemax.com, uh, you know here's here's the sponges that are biodegradable as opposed to the ones made with uh, petroleum products, and here's the cleaners that are uh, you know environmentally that's sensitive right. or biodegradable, or, or you know, and, and then actually because I think that's the sort of I know having looked at my own company's purchasing policies and preferences or whatever. If they don't tell you what to get, people are just going to get what they want anyway. And, and there will be the, the person who takes it to heart and spends the time uh, to, to find the right product that matches their, their morals and, and, and their belief system. And then there's other people who will just order the, the worst possible stuff because that's what they've been ordering since they were a kid. You know? So it, I, I think just identifying the, the particular products that we want to point people to, it makes it a lot easier. They don't have to think about it. It makes... Yeah. the value add for them because they can 
think a little less. Um, or, or maybe the <clears throat> maybe the city could go the way that San Francisco State has gone, which is to centralize purchasing, so that each department didn't do it on their own. That that way, you would have a lot more control over what was bought and what was at not. least for like office supplies, not necessarily for like construction equipment. Yeah, but there. office supplies in particular. Mm -hmm. I think we're small enough that if we implement the guide, that each department should be able to comply. Yeah. Okay. Um, if you want us to help with this, Natalie, it would be very, very useful if you let us know who those preferred suppliers are so that we're not That's right. flailing and spending, wasting a bunch of time on places that are never going to be ordered from. Sure. Okay. There's uh, one other thing on this. That on, under the beginning at the definition, the last sentence, yeah, I think it'd be more indicative of what what we want or what we're trying to go for when the last says this policy is designed so city employees will purchase materials products or services which are fiscally responsible and have the least impact on the environment and it really should be the other way around that they will um, purchase um, materials products and services which have the least impact on the environment as well as being fiscally responsible I, I agree. Me because too. the way it's written now, you've put in fiscally, res fiscally responsible above the least impact on the environment. And the whole purpose for this is to have the least impact on the environment. And I know it seems like a small change, but the whole idea is that we need to change our attitude. And I'll give you one tiny example. Is that at the pool, they always offer to laminate my pass. That's just a piece of plastic I'm going to have to throw away after 12 times it's been punched. Just leave it as a piece of paper. If it gets soggy, you know, give me a new piece of paper. But don't, don't keep offering to laminate it. Don't laminate anybody's pass unless they beg for it, you know. If they want to laminate it, they can go to Office Depot and pay $1.25 and have it done themselves. Yeah, because then you're just having all these pieces of pa plastic to throw away when it should just be a piece of paper. That can be recycled. Where, yeah, this is where a level of consciousness needs to start happening and throughout our whole, our whole world if yes. we expect to be able to overcome this climate crisis. Mm -hmm. Do you happen to know, Natalie, what happens to toner cartridges? Do those get recycled? Mostly. They can be. I don't know what the city does. That, well, I'm asking if the city does. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I always recycle mine. But does the city do that? I assume that we do. I personally don't maintain the copy machines, but I could find out. Okay. Most, yeah. most, co most commercial copy machines, they come and they collect those cartridges and take them away and recycle them because they're considered a hazmat otherwise. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was talking about printer cartridges. That's what I mean, printer cartridges and stuff. And all of the, just in general, all of the stores have usually rebate programs for getting those back. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Or you can switch to uh, cartridgeless printing. Um, but I have, I have specific notes on this if everybody else has gotten through their things. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I... <sighs> I wish that I would have been able to take enough hours off work today to relook at the um, San Mateo County green purchasing policy, but I didn't. And um, but it seems to me my memory is telling me that it was considerably more extensive than this. So was this actually something that was just started to be worked on, or is this based off of the San Mateo County's green purchasing policy? It is based off of San Mateo's. Okay, well, I'll have to go back and look at that again because I thought it was like pages and pages and pages, and here we've got like, you know, eight items. And I thought it was, I just remember it being a lot more extensive than that. I think this one's more extensive because uh, Quinn, our intern, also referred to Berkeley's as well. Okay, okay, maybe I've gone crazy. I think it's all the different example products. I mean, when you count up the example products, there's, Dozens and dozens of items in, in, you know, a dozen broad categories. 
Um, yeah, I'm just going to have to look at it again. I, I, I thought maybe Natalie could answer my question and maybe I'd be satisfied, but I'm, I'm just going to have to go look at it again. Um, specific things, paper, could we add no non-chlorine non bleach because dioxin is a huge issue? Um, and then I was questioning the 30% PCC. I thought San Mateo County's was 50%. Am I crazy there, too? Well, if it's not, ours should be 50%. Ha, ha, ha. Um, some, some of those papers will not go through a copier or a, a, will not, they, they just won't. They're not, the technology, unfortunately, <coughs> hasn't advanced far enough that those papers will go through high-speed copiers without. Um, do we have high-speed copiers here? They're all high speed now. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, I, I think I'm going to mostly disagree with you, okay. Michelle, because I've, I've done some research on this recently. Mm -hmm. And the problems with the early recycled papers is the short fibers, and they were very linty, and they really fouled the machines. But supposedly this current generation of recycled papers is much better. And I, I imagine a lot of that still depends on brand mm -hmm. and manufacturer. Um, but I, and you know, I have a high speed printer at home, but it's a not, I'm sure it's nothing like these. Right. Um, but it can spit out like, you know, 50 pages in a second or something. It's crazy. Um, and I run 100% PCC paper through it and have no problem. So. Oh, then let's yeah, there is definitely. possibilities. Yeah. I'm saying there is possibilities, and we need to explore those possibilities and stretch. I don't, you know, maybe not every, <laughs> not every recycled paper is created equal. So That's I did want to, sure. I did want to agree with you that far. Yeah. Um, maybe we should buy samples and try them in yeah. the city's copiers before we buy like a pallet of it. I think that is an excellent idea, Kima. Yeah. But we should start with the higher Absolutely. recycled Five contents points. and move down if we have problems. Not start low and yeah, consider ourselves content. That's a great point. Okay. Um, so, do, 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 on your kitchen supplies, just a formatting thing, that paragraph is duplicated twice in that box. Um, I was thinking with, yeah, kitchen supplies. Oh, yeah, yeah, in the future. Mm -hmm. The part that says in the future, consider. Yeah, and it's, down. it's cut off on your thing here, but on the oh. paper version, it has that full paragraph twice. Wait, is, one says in the future, consider purchasing a dishwasher, and then the other one says in the future, establish a compost bin. Okay. Are these are these are these details that maybe we could go over offline so we could go through the rest of the agenda? Okay. I think maybe I was no. mistaken. I think. No, no, that, that's that's this in is the repeated. Future, it's just not on the slide. So I think. Okay. Are, yeah. are, are these changes and things that we can go over offline so that we can get through the rest of the agenda? Oh, that sounds like a great idea. Okay. okay. Fine. Yep. Let's do that. Do we have well? Do you have other um, suggestions or comments on the? Because we, we pretty much agree with everything you have, so maybe... Yeah, if we want to add some comments, though, for sure. I just, I like doing things at the meeting because then it's in the record and Absolutely. I have, don't have to run back home and remember to send an email, which I often don't do <laughs> until <laughs> I've forgotten half of what I wanted to say. Um, but if you guys, I understand Camila needs to get out of here, too. I, so. I do, too. I mean, we have a lot, we still have a lot of things on the agenda to go over. Okay. All right. So, how? What are we? What are our thoughts on next steps and a, a plan to move forward on our purchasing guide? Um, does anybody want to uh, volunteer on on identifying uh, products on the preferred suppliers catalogs that would be the uh, preferred items? Or I'd be happy to do it, but not until January. All right. I'm simply I'm working ten hour days right now, so. I think you're the That's best good. qualified to do it and certainly the most 
stringent about it. Well, you're the first person to volunteer, and actually the only person, so I'm happy to have you. If we're content uh, to wait till January, because like I said, I really am working 10-hour days right now, so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, if that doesn't throw our schedule out of loop, then. Excellent. Oh, yeah, that's a good <clears throat> question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're going to look into these things that they could possibly purchase, and then they are either going to do it or they're not, or they're required to do it? Well, um, because if they're not required to do it, maybe we should talk with the people who are doing the ordering and find out how we get them to do it. Yeah. <laughs> I think if we find products, then we would do what's feasible for the city. And so it would be best if we kind of have an idea of what we're looking at as far as products. So could I ask, would this apply to also like schools and other institutions that we have in town or are these managed independently and they would not necessarily follow this guide if we put together a guide? This purchasing guide is only for the city. We could share it with them, but it would be up to each individual uh, organization like the school district whether yeah. they wanted to implement it or not. But if we did the legwork and the f feasibility mm -hmm. of it is compatible, I'm sure that they would want to. Yeah, but it seems to, because it seems to me that yeah, there are other institutions in town that could benefit from it. Yeah. So Absolutely. it would be great to share it with them, I think, once we have it. Yeah, that's a yeah. great idea. And also sharing it with all the businesses as well. That's right. Businesses and all that. Exactly. So that we're not just focusing on one thing, but more. The yeah, it will have a bigger impact, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. This is the city's recommended purchasing guide. That's right. I, I think that's how we should position it. It should exactly. apply to everyone in Brisbane. Mm -hmm. Sure, if they can. Yeah. We can include it as part of Parks and Rec's, um, you know, rent the park program, like here yep. used biodegradable plates and all that. I would be hesitant. I would want. I would want to ask the. Um, I would. I would want to ask staff to confer with the city attorney because once you're putting out recommendations for specific products and specific vendors, you're endorsing a commercial product and. While I'd be happy to to endorse one uh, business over another if they're like say having fresh vegetables in, instead of stale old ones, the city may have a policy about whether it endorses private businesses. That's true. So I, I would just I, I I agree with you. I think it would be great to to uh, put the guide, but then it might not be it might not be uh, possible to do it under the auspices of the city. Uh, you know. The city could follow those guidelines as well, but we couldn't say this is the city of Brisbane's recommended vendor and recommended products to purchase. We'd probably have to either make it more general or say it's not the city of Brisbane's. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, send us the name of the vendors and you know, I'd certainly uh, poke around on their website a little and see what their catalog looks like. Uh, uh, wow. Okay. Let's. Yeah. So discuss the climate. Uh, the approach to the implement the climate action plan. Um, who would like to lead off our discussion on? Uh, the only thought I had about this is that I think if we're going to do this as a subcommittee or something, that we should have a member of the poor planning commission, the poor beleaguer. <laughs> Planning Commission, because I think there are, I just think there are some things that have to happen from a planning side. It was just an opinion. You can agree with me. I'll come off my position if you say why. Well, I actually, I'm, I, don't, I, th I don't think that's a bad idea. I'm just curious about what the scope of the Climate Action Plan is and whether it might make sense to have people from other parts of uh, other stakeholders within the community uh, sure. Certainly, the planning commission. I could see why that would be one of the first to think of. But um, Natalie, what's the scope of the climate action plan in terms of, you know, like, did this the climate action plan get put together and and now we give it to the city council to endorse or is that they they approved it already? They, they okay, we won the Beacon Award. We won the Beacon Gold Award. You know, Nima didn't make it last I, time. Yeah, I was. I'm sorry. I had a calendar <laughs> malfunction. Um, but but yeah. So maybe uh, if Glenn. I was the one who wanted to bring it to the whole committee because the council did approve it. It's written. 
the council still has to act on a number of the provisions in it. There are a number of ordinances, for example, recommended. And so it's not clear to me, even though the council has approved the plan, if they're just going to automatically go forward with this or if we need to keep pushing and how we need to do that. But the other thing is that when, you know, when the subcommittee that consisted of Barbara and me and, and Karen and Natalie um, talked about one of the big things we need to do is education, and that's really what I wanted this committee to talk about. Is there something we could do by way of rolling this thing out, have a community event of some kind? Because we all know that some people watch these meetings, and some people may have even read the Climate Action Plan, but most people in Brisbane will not have done either one. And so I kind of wanted us to talk about <laughs> what are we going to do about that, if anything? What could we do? I think the community's attention right now is so much on the balance with the weekly meetings at the Planning Commission that, I mean, should we plan yeah. for this for January or...? Yeah, and yeah. I don't mean we have to do it now, but but um, if we're going to try to do some kind of big community event or have banners on visitation or something yeah, like start that... planning it now because everything yeah. takes forever. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Work on things on a month to month yeah. basis. Yeah. It might be next year before we get around to doing the event. Yeah, I think we should be targeting um, post FEIR. Well, yeah, we that's fine. But I, I think Planning it's definitely it. something that we should have at next year's um, day in the park, but obviously we can't wait that long. Um, well, how about let's target something for Earth Day? That's so the thing great. that I, that I think Karen and I discussed was to have a rollout potentially next meeting. What, what does that mean to have a rollout next meeting, I guess? So we were going to discuss climate action plan highlights and show the video that was made at Community Park. And um, we were going to have Ray and Lori here as well. Okay. Those are, do we really want to do the video in the meeting? I mean, it seems like it would take up a huge amount of our time. Maybe we should watch that in advance. It's a seven-minute video. Oh, just seven minutes? Okay. And I felt that that would kind of bring the community in to watch. Yeah, yeah. I realized <coughs> it was only seven minutes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it ready? Is it available? Um, it has been already made, and there are some edits being made, and so it should be ready by next meeting. Let's okay. watch it next By November 10th. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I have no. If it's just seven minutes, back I have off no. that for planning mm -hmm. implementation or what we're going to do for implementation. Seems to stymie me a little bit. But. Yeah, yeah, it is a tough question. We should include Francisco on our at our, our education outreach committee. <laughs> the library oh. manager. Yeah, I would actually like to do something. You know, we talked about um, banners on Visitation Avenue. I'd still like to do that. I'd like to do posters. I'd like to do maybe some film, maybe a film series. Uh, Naomi Klein's Naomi Klein and Rick Lewis have made a new movie. Naomi, Naomi Klein wrote "This Changes Everything." Mm -hmm. They've made a new movie, and it's available for community showings. I think it cost about two hundred dollars to do that. What is uh, the name of the movie? "This Changes Everything." Oh, that's the name of the movie. Oh. Yeah, mm -hmm. and there are a couple other films that have been made. So I'm thinking maybe a film series would get people to come out. I don't yep. know. And for the film series, we can just reserve Mission Blue and have them there, or the community center, yeah. Yeah, I know, that's what I wanted here. to talk about. We did the no deposit, no return here. Mm -hmm. We could do movies here, too. We could do them at the library. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, it was actually fun having it here. Yeah, it was fun so having it So people can watch remotely as well when we do it here, right? Because it will get broadcasted. Okay, well, that's actually a great place. I'd love to do that. We've talked about doing that for years. Uh, it's just never gotten well, let's set the attention. Well, the, the meeting next, next meeting, and then mm -hmm. possibly even working on looping that onto the television. Okay. Because mm -hmm. we yeah. talk about having something on the television where it would go over and over and over, and if we have more and more things that are being looped, it would give people an opportunity to flip on that channel or maybe even give them a reason to flip on that channel. Yeah, I don't know. I just don't know if broadcasting it gets into licensing problems with some of these things. Yeah, I don't either. I think the I think for that film it's probably a one shot. 
showing, but I haven't really looked into it. I just yeah. wondered if people were interested. Yes. Another thing we could do is, uh, I don't know, book book club type things, people talking about climate, you know, encourage people to talk about it. I don't know. I'm just a little bit frustrated with, with trying to get attention to climate change beyond the people who are already paying attention. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. Um, our, our shelf at the library keeps disappearing, and I'm, I'm trying to get it back, and it it's not back yet? No. And I can only be so pushy, you know. I, I say please as many times as I can, and I keep getting told yes. But yes doesn't turn into uh, I did it. Hmm. So. Hmm. so is next meeting, is there something that could be done to make a rollout for next meeting? Or do you really think it needs to wait until next year? You know, people well, are really kind of overwhelmed with everything going on right with, now. With yeah, the Aliens so. and Parkside, I am, you know, I think we can do some low-key things, like visual things, like the banners on visitation. Mm -hmm. But in terms of, I'm sorry, I, I love you all and agree with you all, but I think in terms of trying to actually change people's minds and educate them, this is not the time. This oh, I totally happen. agree. I just wanted to talk about it so Absolutely. that, as Michael said, you know. I was afraid I was... <laughs> undermining you, Glenn. No. Okay. No. No, I, f I feel overwhelmed, too. I've been to so many meetings, I can't see yeah. straight. Yeah. So. So shall we, uh, other, we'll have the, you know, the, the sort of launch next month with the uh, with, uh, um, video and the council members, and then we'll do a, a sort of a public. Yeah. Launch. I mean, I think sharing the video with the public, I think, will start to like bring yeah. things to people's attention. I'm sure a lot of people haven't read the Climate Action Plan, given that there is so much to read about Baylands and Parkside projects and many others. So I think sharing a video will most probably kind of bring the issue to people's attention, and then we go from there. Yeah, if we do have some big film event or something, I'd like to see if the, if the mayor would write a letter to everybody in Brisbane and invite them and encourage them to come for the movie and discussion afterward because this is really important and see if we could get some, some people who don't usually show up. Yeah. I bet if we have snacks, we'll get more people. That <laughs> food is always food. helps. Food is good. The only thing I'd say is I wish we could provide booze, but that's not Then we'd get lots of people. <laughs> then we get lots so of people. <laughs> I, I, was, I didn't want to go there, here. but yeah, that was understated. Okay, my company will do donate the snacks. There'll be organic food to support the environmentally friendly topic. So, <laughs> so we yeah. can provide food. I, I'm sure I could find a purveyor of organic. Yeah, maybe Kim will <laughs> deliver the organic <laughs> wine and then we'll go from there. I'm pretty sure I, I, I know of at least one. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Mm -hmm. So right. we should be able to bring people in, right? Food and wine? Yeah. Oh, um, organic. But we can't do wine if we do it here. Can we set it out all in the, lo in the parking lot? <laughs> yeah. We've done it in the lobby before. We have? Okay. All right. They certainly have wine in the little receptions that they have in there. Yeah. Absolutely. Huh? Anyway, let's okay. go okay. on. We have a lot, still a lot to Absolutely. do. Absolutely. Natalie's clucking at us. <laughs> All right. Uh, do we have any anybody else want to uh, discuss an approach to the climate action plan? If not, uh, um, maybe if we could each come with an idea that we feel like is low and uh, look through the climate action plan and pick out an idea that we feel is low enough impact that we could potentially do it without drowning people. Wait, low impact, low effort. L like low impact requires. Low not too much engagement of, on people's parts. I think Michelle can post a picture of her water bottle. It's all glass and encourage people to use glass water bottles instead of plastic. That's a very low impact, but I think everyone can afford it for like ten, twelve dollars. These bottles, I think, are multifunctional. This was a gift from Camille. I'm very, <laughs> very happy with it. Yeah. And it, it doesn't heat up nearly as much in the car as my plastic one. Yeah. Plastic one did. I had several of those, but I had to stop giving them to my son. Mm. Why? He loses them? Because he'd throw his backpack down. Oh. Uh, I wonder if we could get a climate-related fact sent out every week with the Brisbane website. Alert. Good Lord, it's been a year since we've got an invasive species in the newspaper. But what, what if we included a climate fact right at the beginning? Yeah, I agree. I'm all I think that should it. be there every month. We should have a different type of fact. 
that should be in the you news. You have to get the paper. person who writes the star involved because yeah. it's not getting done. No, I'm talking about the website alerts. Oh, okay, the website alerts. Okay. Yeah, the ones that come out every. That was those come out every week. Yeah. Well, is that possible? To I, do? Yeah. Uh, would outreach and Ed want to write facts each week? Yeah, we can put a list together. I mean, I can't do it this week, but we could certainly do it. You know, I'm talking about things like the fact that each gallon of gas burned in the car emits about 20 pounds of carbon dioxide. You know, if people start sure. seeing that, yeah, that sea level rise is projected to rise by, you know, sea levels are projected to rise by X feet. I mean, I think that's a really good idea because a lot of these facts are already in the climate action plan. It's just us taking them from there and bringing them to people's attention because not everyone has time to read the whole plan. So I think that's a great idea. I think a lot of the information is already in this document. It is. It's really bubbling it up to the people's attention. So I think that's a great idea. And the thing about those website alerts is it's one page. So, so these would be like one sentence at the yeah. top of the page. A subtle way to start pushing it. Yeah. Yes, bringing it to people's attention in a way in which I think it's a great idea. And we already have the facts. We can just, yeah. Okay. Do we have to get approval of that from somebody or somewhere? Caroline puts that together, right? Yeah, if, if you guys send me something and I will forward it to Caroline. I mean, they do edits on, you know, if they need to do edits. Yeah. Okay. All right. So are we going to take Barbara's idea of looking through the plan and seeing what we want to pick and choose first? Is that something we would discuss next meeting? I think that's a great idea. Just bring forward Why something don't... simpler, simple that we can tackle without choking ourselves. All right. Okay. Subcommittee reports, community festival. I'm going to represent the uh, Community Festival Subcommittee on behalf of Megan, my uh, co-subcommittee member. Um, we, had a, we had a table at Day in the Park, and it was uh, successful. I'll, I'll open it up to the committee members for their impressions, but I feel that we had a, a good presence, and there were some interesting, interested people who came by and perused oh. our information. And I forgot my survey. And the people, certainly we had a lot of people who participated, in, or people who did participate in the filming. Yep. yep. And that, I get very excited to see the, the film. Yeah, absolutely. Any other, any other thoughts or comments about the uh, day in the park? I'll have to bring the survey next time. That would be great. Yeah, please do. And then, All right. uh, this is a great letter. Let's just get it done. Fracking. Yeah. Letter. Awesome. The only thing I wanted to say is I might change the word caustic for carcinogenic. But that's up to you. So Wait a minute. Know. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Good idea. All right. Okay. Where, where uh. is this, Barbara? Um, put in parentheses what you want, where you want it. And I don't yeah. Know uh, it last line of the fourth paragraph. So sources have noted caustic and radioactive chemicals. I was going to think maybe carcinogenic is a stronger word, but... But then you require evidence. Evidence. Okay, I, I have seen that published, but I wouldn't be able to tell you where. Why don't we say toxic? Okay, fine. Is that okay with you, Michael? It's your letter. It's fine with me. Okay. Whatever yeah. gets it out to the city council sooner. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Sooner is better. Yeah, that's true. I, I wouldn't... One word is enough. <laughs> Okay. Excellent. Staff Th updates? Yes? Yeah, absolutely. Staff updates. So, okay. Lagoon Cleanup Day, we had 45 Everybody volunteers, and the county reported to me that approximately 3,633 um, 3, gallons of solid waste was removed. How much? Wow. 3,633. That's from our lagoon or all over? Yes. From the Lagoon Cleanup Day. So awesome the area that it covered. Cool. One thing that was really uh, disheartening is the area that I worked on cleaning up with um, Terry, the mayor. Uh, we did the section from the freeway off ramp to the first stop sign. And we did over seven 50 gallon 
garbage bins. No, you mean a 50, 50, okay. Seven 50-gallon garbage bins plus a whole bunch of other stuff, including like numerous bags of urine that truck drivers are apparently throwing out there. And just really vile and disgusting stuff. And it was very disheartening over the, since the time we had the cleanup day to watch it reaccumulate. And today when I got off the freeway, there was two trucks parked there. And um, I don't know what they were doing. I didn't stop to ask. It was the middle of the day. But it just really was disgusting to see all the litter and garbage again. And it seems to be everybody's favorite pee stop where people get off the freeway and pee. And I, I think it needs to be addressed by public safety and the Brisbane PD and Highway Patrol. That's not, that's not a pit stop for people to get out of their cars and go pee behind a bush or throw their urine out there. It was just really, really disgusting. Well, at least yeah. if they're vaping, they'll get arrested. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> um. So, anyway, the cleanup was a lot of work, and then, and then to see it just not even be two months and, and have all it, all this just disheartening. Not even a month. Oh. We need a sting operation. Three days, and it's a, a mess there again. All right. Any other thoughts on lagoon cleanup? Deep root watering. So... That is with Public Works staff, and Karen has that update, which she will give next meeting. Where's Karen, anyway? She landed today from vacation, so oh, she's okay. jet-lagged. Yeah. Awesome. I have forgotten that. Thank you, Natalie. Mm -hmm. And Monterey Pine removal? Um, so between November 2014 and October 2014, we have received 30 permits to remove uh, dead and deceased trees, most of them from Valley Park. Or awesome. That sounds really good. I'm glad that they're all heeding the El Nino warning and taking out those trees before they come down in the wet. It's a lot of money and a big investment, so I'm glad people are actually finding the money to do that. Yeah. Good. That's great. Water reductions. So... Um, I was asked to repeat that Brisbane is a small water dealer, which means the mandates were different from other. So basically, um, we're a small water dealer because we serve only a certain amount of people. And so we are not required. The reductions that we were required to make are different. And so our, the reduction choice that we had were either to reduce 25% or do a two-week-a-day irrigation schedule, which we went with a two-day-a-week irrigation schedule. Um, and so, in comparison with the State Control Resources Board, they're comparing June 2015 to February 2016. Actually, sorry, June 2013 through February 2014. And so, the comparisons that we were made were from June to September. So, from June to September 2015, there were 20.3 percent reductions. And if you compare just um, actually June to September of 2015, the reductions were 25.3% if we Wonderful. just know that. So basically the community has been receptive and responsive in um, complying with uh, faulty irrigation. And so things have been going pretty well as far as, and people have been calling in complaints and we've been responding to those as well. That's great. Um, I was wondering uh, if, Karen had a chance to chastise Sustainable San Mateo County because they published us as being up 4%, not down 25%. Yeah, um, so where they're, I'm not sure where they're getting their data from, but we have been in contact with them several times and we've been sending them up-to-date yeah. data and, in their, and they're still not publishing the correct numbers. So we have been in contact with them several times about it because that's embarrassing <laughs> yeah yeah basically they're they're treating us like everybody else when we're not the same um okay. and so the the numbers need to be adjusted i do have one uh area it kind of goes back to day in the park and wasting water but whoever decided to like totally saturate oh my god the lawn the day before day in the park Every year. My shoes are ruined. My it was a mud ruined. mess. 
it was disgusting. It killed a lot of the lawn because people stepped on it when it was that wet and it became a mud puddle. Mm -hmm. And that was just, that was, talk about a waste of water and also really was very uncomfortable and unpleasant all yeah. day. And it seems to happen on a frequent occurrence that they overwater the lawn right before an event. This note gets given every year and every year they somebody screws it up. And this year was worse than ever. It was worse than ever and it was embarrassing and I have a brown tide line about three inches up the fav bottom of my favorite skirt. So I yeah. believe it also rained the night before. No. No. It didn't. Okay. Believe me this did not was not from if, if it had rained enough to make it that wet we would be like having a lot more happiness right now. <laughs> Who, yeah, I who's who's responsible for watering the, the park? That should be Public Works, but I'll check. Yeah. Maybe maybe we could change the watering schedule not to be the first Friday of every October. Because <laughs> it seems like the first Saturday of every October we have this issue. Yeah. Well, somebody needs to go in there and remember and override the program, and it just never happens. And and if they're watering that much, they're overwatering. Period. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Water related water reductions. Uh, any other comments on water in Brisbane? CCA PCE update. Uh, you met, you skipped over Parkside plan. Oh. No. Oh, I'm looking at the staff okay. updates. Yeah. Oh, I see. It's in a different order than my printed version. Never mind. Yeah. What is CC? You, your choice on what you'd like to. Um, I'll, choice just, I'll just go over community choice okay. aggregation. Um, so now it's called Peninsula Clean Energy. Okay. And um, there were pamphlets of information at the community festival. Um, so the feasibility study has been completed, presented to the Board of Supervisors. There are three basic scenarios that um, were discussed in the, um, in the study. And so the three scenarios are, um, just, just to give them very short, uh, 35 to 50% for scenario of renewable energy for scenario one. Scenario two is 50 to 75%. And the, the, this they would ratchet up. So they would start at 50 and go up to 75. And then scenario three is 100% renewable energy. And in either case, the customer can always go up to 100% renewable for a premium rate if they wish to. Um, and this, again, is an opt-out program, so if people choose that they don't want to get any percentage of renewable energy, they can opt out. Um, and there will be fees associated with that. Um, so now the County of Sustainability will have a goal to adopt a joint powers agreement by this winter and potentially launch um, Peninsula Clean Energy by August of 2016. Woo! That's great. So um, their, I guess their website that they created about Peninsula Clean Energy will launch in a day or two. So if I, if I get notified about that, then I could forward it to you guys. So we'll see something in our bill come August 2016. Potentially, if everything goes according to their plan. And um, what, I, sorry, go ahead. Well, what would derail that plan? Is there people arguing for dirty or cheaper energy, like the Chamber of Commerce or someone? PG&E no. is trying to move against it. Okay. And um, there, there are risks yeah, associated away. with each scenario, and so a scenario has to be adopted, and they're starting public education. And so um, I don't. who knows if their rollout will be pushed back or further or delayed. So I. that's yeah. all the information that well, I have. They're already about advertising that. on television. So. I'll check yeah. the website. Um, I'm, I'm talking to this thing, and I don't <laughs> Is it work? Yeah, it is working. Um, so I didn't know that that was at the community festival. Does anybody have a copy of the brochure that I didn't get? I can email it to you. Yes, please. Thank you. That would be great. Oh. Does anybody else want it? I wanna, it? Well, you're going to send out with the website, right? So we'll, be, we'll, we'll all get it. We'll be able to get all the information when you send out the, the link to the website when it gets put up. So the website will come out in two days. Okay. Um, Hopefully I get notified about it because that would be coming from sustainable San Mateo County. Um, but I have the pamphlet now. Okay. So I, don't, I don't know if you guys want the pamphlet tomorrow without the, the website that I may or may not get. I can, I can take it in electronic form. Sure. Save a tree. 
All righty, Parkside Plan representative. So Parkside Plan, um, the planning department has asked for OSEC to elect a representative um, to basically do stakeholder meetings. And so the stakeholder meeting is on the 28th and it would be um, a time interval of about one hour or so, so they would coordinate with you on that, and then you'd be kind of like the constant contact for the project. Um, it's too bad Camille had to go because she emailed me saying that she was interested, so it, she's not here. I don't know if anyone else. Well, in the really Brisbane Lions Club, we always nominate the person who's not here. <laughs> yeah. There's precedent. I'm good with that. Well, I mean, I was going to volunteer as well. I don't know. Is anybody else interested in doing it? Or so there, there would be only one representative, right. such as when Glenn was on the sustainability subcommittee, she would attend those meetings and then she would report back to you guys and you give feedback. And then, so she would be the, the one person. Could there be an alternate in case somebody's sick? I don't think there'll be an alternate. I mean, they would only go to the one meeting on the 28th and then they would be in communication either via phone or email. Okay. Let me ask a quick question about this park site. Is this something that's going to go through or is this something we vote on? I, I'm a little confused and I, I get, well, sorry, but I get tons yeah. and tons of people asking me questions at work. I'm not involved in this plan at all. This okay. is the planning department. And so I'm just bringing this forward because they asked me for an so OSEC the city of Brisbane is pushing it, is behind it? Yes. Or is this an outside developer? No, this is the city of Brisbane. It is in the early planning phases. There is the pop-up thing this that. Saturday, and I suggest that we go and ask a lot of questions there because I think I know some things, but I don't want to comment in case I, I don't know what I think I know. I don't think we normally get a vote on something like that. It's it's. No. Um, I just don't want to be. No, and you know, it's us as a committee. I meant yeah. the citizens of Brisbane. Yeah. Because no. the citizens of Brisbane feel like they they can make the choice whether it's going to go through or not, and you know, from a, a outside pool, me, um, I would say most people are not happy with the idea. Yeah, I just don't think a vote is automatic. Um, we've been promised that we would get a vote on the Baylands, yeah. but I don't think that applies to this development okay. so it's it's basically this up to the city to approve or not and supposedly they're going to take into account what they hear from citizens well then I'll direct everybody to the city of Brisbane then. yeah yeah but tell them tell them to go to the pop-up and become educated and then express ed educated opinions to the city council and my understanding is I might be completely wrong, but it was just like some proposed zoning changes with some potential examples of development that could happen with those zoning changes. But it's still up to the landowners to actually uh, make make those changes. So it's not, if my understanding is correct, and I could be wrong because I haven't heard very much about it. It's all been mysterious. There's been a lot of, there's been a lot of, Furrer, but I haven't actually seen anything concrete. Uh, is that you know the, the the landowners would still be the ones that would have to develop the land, um, you know, and and so presumably there would be some housing element, which would make it afford uh, 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 profitable, and mm -hmm. you know they'd be trying to get some retail in. But but it's all it's yeah. I, I, unfortunately, I won't be able to make it on Saturday, so I'm I'm a little disappointed that uh, you know. Such, such short get notice was given, but whatever. Um, I'll have opportunity to figure it out. So, yeah, I we still have to correct Kima. We still have to pick a representative. Yeah. yeah. So Kima, you're the chair. I think you're probably the one that they wanted the most. I think they wanted the you chairs. Can't make but if you, no, 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 I can't make it on Saturday to the pop up yeah. event. But I, oh. I can make it to the on the twenty eighth. Yeah. Okay. If you coordinate, so if, you if, want to be the representative. If it pleases my committee members to elect me, I would be proud to serve in their in their honor. Sure, sure. Go ahead, go for it, Kima. All right. Okay, great. So you'll probably get an email from uh, Julia then. All right. Okay. Sounds great. Great. Thank you. Just put it on my calendar. And and that's the twenty eighth, right? That Thursday, the twenty eighth. Yes. That is the. Um, it's. May I ask one staff question? 
Uh, we ever heard anything about getting a trash can out on Quarry Road near <laughs> Owl and Buckeye Canyons? People actually clean up. <laughs> what? They actually pick up and empty throw the trash away. It's my my favorite subject that it's it just seems like such a basic thing to have. It's been we did have one and and it's gone missing. Um, and then I know Karen was following up because she maybe felt the the county could replace it, um, but. I'll check in with her about that. Okay. It's going to go the way of our invasive species articles if you're not careful, Glenn. <laughs> I had I had one last uh, update, mm -hmm. or kind of an update. So at Day in the Park, I coordinated with uh, South San Francisco Scavenger, and I thought it would be cool or someone would be interested if they were rewarded by interviewing, that if they pulled the green chip that they would get a tour of the anaerobic digester and even though Megan tried no one was interested so are any of you interested in going in touring the anaerobic digester I am I am okay. too can we go together you can be my spouse for the day Kima or yeah can we arrange a tour like in January <laughs> well yeah um you, you I'd love to you or I will, would contact uh Barbara Bernardini mm -hmm. um so all of you are interested if if it's doable, if it's not, sure. I mean, I yeah, I don't have a conflict. We could have a field trip. I'd like that. Yeah. Okay. Now, so so maybe we'll just coordinate by email and see what day works for everybody, and then I could contact her and ask her, you know. Uh, how does that work with the Brown Act in terms of us all being in the same place at the same time? We can have field trips. And you know, we could I'm call not a meeting. Sure that we really yeah. fall under the Brown Act as a committee. We're not a commission. We don't vote and make city policy. Mm -hmm. But as a respect to the city, we follow the Brown Act in regard to our meetings. But unless you're going to have a meeting about anaerobic digesters when we go on the field trip, we're probably okay. Yeah, but they're a, they're a contractor to the city. They provide some of our public utilities. You know, I, I think, just want to make sure that we I think it would just be an informational meeting, and as long as you guys don't make decisions about OSEC while you're on your field trip, then I, I think it would be... As long as we're not like, trying to solve climate change while we're there or something, we're, we're good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That sounds I great. Have we uh, approved the minutes from the last Nope. Meeting? All right. Barbara, please provide your updates to the minutes. Okay. So Section 3A, um, item about halfway down, high support for PV panels but limited support for use in gas consumption reduction. Yeah, That's I just... And that either funny English. Um, loss, uh, towards the bottom of that section, Los Angeles Sheriff's Department will test a Tesla, not may. Um, at least I certainly hope the world doesn't fall apart and they change their mind, but we'll, let's think positively. Um, final item, uh, title 24 training on chapter 11, copy of the environmental purchasing guide, and writing le legislation for cap measures. I just didn't, I just didn't, okay, never mind. It, it reads clearer this time. It was confusing at the, in the wee hours of this morning. Um, then the next section, energy measures, 3.1.1b. Door-to-door -door information, Salmon would like programs um, to be vetted. Oh. Which programs? I mean, I'm sure you know what you were talking about, Sam and Michelle, but it was confusing to me what this document was referring to. Is that referring, referring to, to the door-to-door -door information? On energy measures. Well, I guess I can add um, basically for home upgrades. Okay. That, that would make it clear for me. Mm -hmm. I actually do refer back to these, so... Um, yeah, like if, if, if you have every Tom, Dick, and Harry calling about energy upgrades, and we can do this to your house, and we can do that. Mm -hmm. I would like those programs vetted mm -hmm. before they're released on the public. Okay. Or have a list of, you know, um, these programs that the city endorses that they're not some fly-by-night. Yeah. You know, travelers I, to take I, their mm -hmm. money for no good reason. I thought that's what you meant. I just wanted to be clarified in this document. Okay. Um, 
And then I guess I actually probably should have brought this up under committee members. Um, 3.3, Fieldman, Fieldman suggests links to Craigslist and FreeCycle on the city website. Was that done? No. Okay. Can you see that's done for the next meeting? I will have to make sure that it's okay for that to be posted on the city website, but okay. I will check that. If not, let us know what's happening. And then staff updates, number six, uh, solicit recommendations for tree services. Uh, if anything more should be done and take recommendations to council for the, the trees. Uh, was that followed up on? Number six, last item. Um, that might be an update from Karen. Okay. Can you add that uh, to the list of updates we'll receive next time? Sure. And then um, final uh, B, Monterey Pines. Chamber of Commerce will do outreach to property managers for the removal of Pon Monterey Pines on Valley Drive. Did anybody reach out to the Chamber of Commerce to see? Yes. Ladywood? Okay, good. So we got one of three done. That was it. Are the minutes approved with edits? Do I have a motion to approve the minutes as amended? Oh. Yep. Excellent. Go ahead. Do I'll I second, second it. Second. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Excellent. And do we have a, uh, a motion for adjournment? We have a motion for Halloween. Happy I Halloween. I have a motion that we adjourn. I want a motion for Happy Halloween. All right. Do we, uh, I second your motion for Happy Halloween. I did Halloween. look at it. All in Thank favor you. of print it out. Halloween. The only one thing I, I have to say <laughs> is I won't be able to make the tent. Okay. okay. You or Michelle. Oh. Do we, do we have a problem with a quorum? If we're missing two people, are we missing any others? For no, I think we're fine with We just need four. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. As long as it's just those two. I'd like to remind everybody to join us on um, Saturday night at the Mission Blue Center for the screening of Edge of the Wild. I have four events that evening. Oh, I've got guess you won't be joining us. I'll be, I'll be camping, really but maybe next time.